Hi, welcome to the 6502 Show. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the programs of a guy who was in on the beginning of the personal computer revolution. You know who these guys are. And I'm sure you know who these guys are. You very likely even know who this guy is. But do you know this guy? That guy is Mac Oglesby. He was a teacher in Vermont for over 35 years, teaching math and shop to kids for decades. And during a lot of that time, and even after into retirement, he was involved in programming computers, and especially making games that would be both fun and educational for kids. Let's take a brief look at how Mac got started and what he was using, and then let's play some of those early games from the 1970s. In the late aughts, Mac told Carl Sabansky of MySundial.ca that he got started after a fortuitous encounter with Eugene Fucci, then at the Dartmouth College Kewitt Computing Center. And in 1974, Professor Fucci lent Mac a teletype and a modem that would tie into the Dartmouth timesharing system, and he could use Timeshare Basic. Mac said, My goal during the summer was to justify my being allowed to continue on DTSS, and for the next nine or ten years through the mid-80s, I happily maintained their library of programs called LMLib. During those years, I gradually learned a lot about basic programming. And with that access to Dartmouth Basic and the timesharing system, Mac began to quickly churn out a lot of interesting programs, such as Dodgem and Modi and so many more. It would be a lot of fun to put these early programs through their paces. So let's do just that on the PAL-1 6502 single board computer using Kim-1 Basic 9. First, let's take a look at Dodgem. This was written by Mac in 1975. The game originally appeared in uh, Scientific American uh, Magazine, Marvin Gardner's Mathematical Games column in June of 75. And the original game concept was by Colm Vount, a student at Cambridge University in England. And he had invented the game in 1972. Well, let's uh, do a smaller board size just for demonstration. Just me today. And I'm going to take advantage and go first. I am the letters. So I'm going to move letter A north. And then I'm going to move B north. And I'll move A again north. My goal is to get my letters off the board at the top. The computer's goal is to get its numbers off the board to the right. Uh, I'm going to go A north again. Looks like I got this one in hand. Just in time. Now let's take a look at Sinners. This is based on a game called The Three Musketeers by Har Hulim, and it was described in Sid Saxon's 1968 book, A Gamut of Games. Mac adapted this to Dartmouth Basic in the winter of 76, and it appeared in the People's Computer Company newspaper in July of that year. And you absolutely have to see the original artwork that went along with this article when it appeared in 1976. I tell you, People's Computer Company newspaper was pretty far out. 
Well, let's take a look at the instructions. Three evil fiends moved by the computer will play against a group of condemned sinners in purgatory moved by me. If the sinners win, the survivors will be set free. Otherwise, <laughs> it's into the black pit. So we're going to have a playing board five by five. As the sinners, I can move into any adjacent empty space and the fiend wants to move into an adjacent space that contains a sinner. And it'll be, it'll capture that letter and, well, there we go. No diagonal moves, no jumps. The sinners win if all the fiends are in a line, horizontally or vertically. So our job as the sinners is to line these guys up, three in a row. Hopefully there's a few of us left to escape the black pit. The movement is just the same as dodge them. You pick your letter and you tell it, I want to go north, south, east, or west. We can resign if it gets really ugly. There's even some help with legal moves if you get stuck. Let's start the game. All right. So... Let's uh, try to lure these fiends into a line. And I don't have many options to move. I can move B, H, or L. I think I'm going to move H to the west. And in this case, the fiend that was uh, below the I is now uh, went over and chomped on the M and took that one out of play. That one in the far corner is going to be tough to move. Well, I'll work on it, and you can rejoin me in just a moment. Well, as you can see, I've played a little bit. I got them lined up diagonally, but that doesn't count. We're going to have to keep going. There are a lot fewer letters on the board. I have a hunch there are going to be a lot fewer by the time I get done. Well, I think I'm in a pretty good position here. If I move J to the west, and if the fiends have to capture a soul every time, I'm hoping that they don't get smart and one of the vertical ones takes T. Let's see what happens. And, of course, it did. Pretty smart little program. Oh, boy, this doesn't look good. Well, it's going to take... I can't... Well, I can move P or I can move A. Or V. Could move V. Now I've got to move V or A. Uh, I'm not going to win. I'm going to be too far away. I'll get down to the last one. So A goes east, gets gobbled up. P goes east, gets gobbled up. And I can, well, I can move you east, but that's the last of us. And there's the game. I have rarely won this game. It's really tough, really challenging, and a lot of fun to play. The next game to play is called Capture. Mac completed this in February of 1978, and he'd completed a pet version 
in early 1980. And this ran on the PET 2001, and it would even run in 8K. Let's uh, get her going. Well, okay then. I did add this fidget spinner, so uh, it is the 21st century after all. All right, now we're at the instructions. So when you call a letter, you're going to capture that field, everything around it, uh, three on each side, three uh, north and south, and then to varying degrees, this diamond shape will be captured. Uh, everything but a space. And that can be either a dot or another letter or your opponent's already captured spaces. So when the last letter's played, we'll be done and we'll tally up. Let's get going. Okay, just the one of me. And as you'll see, this computer program is cold-blooded, so I'm going first. All right, so... What letter can I pick where we'll capture the most dots or other letters? Hmm. Kind of sparse out there. Why don't I take C? All right. Looks like I captured uh, 10, uh, 13 dots. All right. Now, the program is going through its possibilities letter by letter. This is why I said it's cold-blooded, ruthlessly efficient. I don't think I've ever won this game. There's still hope. I believe I can. There must be some way. Well, we'll see what I can do as we move along. It took M down there for a pretty good haul itself. It got 13 also. Okay, I'll report back in with you as we get toward the end of the game. Okay, we're down to our last two letters here, B and H. And if you were wondering how I was clearing the screen and jumping to a home cursor position, I'm using ANSI escape codes, VT100 escape codes, to make that happen. And the language we're playing the game in is Microsoft Basic version 1.1, more commonly known in the 6502 community as Kim1 Basic 9, KB9. I think I'm going to take H. And for once, I've got what looks like a fairly decent field. It's going to take B, it has to. Now we tally up. Tie game. That is that's one of my best results. <laughs> wow, not bad. Uh, Sometimes, you know, and it's, the score is different every time you, you play because the board layout's completely different. But uh, any time I can score 80, I count that as a big win. Let's take a look at a little program called Frogs. Mac wrote this in December of 1974, and it appeared in the People's Company newspaper in 1975. Here we go. Let's see how to play. Eight pieces on nine squares. The idea is to swap them, move the percents over to where the stars are and vice versa. And I can slide or I could jump one uh, over one piece. Pretty typical Mac Oglesby input. 
two numbers and you that's where you were and where you want to be. Supposedly, one can win this game in 24 moves. Let's see what happens. Every fifth turn, you get a new little playing uh, ruler to see where you are, help you make your moves. I think I may have already painted myself into a bit of a corner. Can't move an empty cell, so better do 89 instead. Uh, and there's the corner I'm painted into. So back up to 78, back up to 67. Now I can jump 46 there. Twenty-four goes there. Three to one. Oh, can't go three to one. I've got three to two. So it's got great error checking, but um, another thing it's got is difficulty. I'm already on what is that? Twenty-one moves. So apparently, I am not one who can do it in twenty-four. Maybe you'll do better. Now we've got a program called Moti. This is based on the 1974 novel, The Moat in God's Eye, by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell. And uh, Mac wrote this in June 1975, so probably soon after he finished the book, he got the idea to use it as a scenario for a much older game. In the 1870s, probably even a little earlier, there was a game called The Soldier's Game, or The Military Game. And French soldiers used to play this game during the Franco-Prussian War, uh, especially younger fellas, you know, to help them kind of refine their tactics of how to move their units on the battlefield. Well, Mac adapted that, added the scenario, and suddenly we have the fate of the human race at stake. Let's give it a run. Yeah, let's look at the instructions. Barring little bits and bobs from the novel to set up the scenario. And we can see that we only have a 11 point map and how things can move in only in certain ways. So the humans will have three starships, and the Modi has one. Play goes in turns can move to any vacant point. The hitch is the Modi can move anywhere along the conduits that it wants. The humans can only move forwards or sideways. And the Modi ship will win the game and conquer the humans if the humans can't trap the Modi after 15 turns or there's a three-time repetition of any position. Or if they get to the final gateway, of course. Oh, it's very close. It's at point four. I'm going to move... I'm going to try to force it back. It can't go to two. It can only go to five. So I'm going to go from three to five. This is the exact same movement system that we just saw in Frogs. All right, it went back to... Seven, let's go one to four. I'm really loath to leave point zero unguarded. 
but I don't think I can trap him otherwise. It's going to it's gonna go either to 7 or 9. It's probably going to 9. I'm going to go 0 to 3. Oops. Illegal move. Extra ignored. Yes, yes. Just because I'm a sloppy typist. Oh, it went back to 7. Okay, I think we've got a shot at this. Oh dear. Yeah, I might not be in a good place here. Because no matter what I do now, it's going to have an out. Well, good thing you're still watching. And if I go to 10, I can't come backwards. I'm kind of screwed that way. And now it's going to get behind me no matter what because I have to move. And maybe I can put off the inevitable. No, nope, going to lose. No matter what I do, it's going to slip by me either at 0.4 or 0.5. And at that point, there's nothing I can do because I can't go backwards. Well, let's, uh, let's play this out. Let the Modis have their due. Goodbye, human race. Another little uh, allusion to the novel. Using Dartmouth Basic and then later Commodore Basic, once he got a PET 2001, Mac wrote dozens of educational programs and other programs that were suitable for kids. A lot of those appeared in People's Computer Company newspaper, Creative Computing Magazine, Kilobod, and a bunch of other publications. He even was a co-author on the book Pet Games and Recreations, which was published in 1981. Len Lindsay did a large part of the book, Mac said, but the publisher apparently got mad at Len for something. Mac's name went to the top of the author list. The book didn't sell very well, and Mac said, quote, I don't think it made enough to even recover the advance paid. Maybe there was no market for a collection of program listings, but I suspect the book didn't sell well because of the color of the cover. Well, can't blame him there. I think he was right. And I don't think the dinosaur helped either. After retirement, Mac kept interest in all things mathematical, but especially sundials. He built this unique sundial to commemorate his wife Claire's 35-year career at her school, and he also developed many other unique designs. Mac began using QBASIC for his sundialing computing activities and developed many programs to help folks design their own sundials no matter where on the planet they lived. He also made educational materials around sundials and volunteered in the classroom, going so far as to bring in and set up a stack of old pets to his daughter's classroom. Dad enjoyed the processes of exploration and teaching children to use creative inquiry to learn and understand. He spent hours researching and thinking of interesting ways to engage his math students using games and interactive activities. His students embraced maths in ways they never had before as he helped them understand how it related to the world around them, and he mixed in a good bit of fun. His classroom was always filled with interesting math games and projects. In 2007, Mac was awarded the North American Sundial Society's top award citing his special designs, educational activities, and willingness to help others. I want to say a big thanks to Carl Sabansky and especially Alice Io Oglesby for helping out with this video and really making it possible. This is one of the longer things I've done so far, but uh, it's been one of the most rewarding. You know, Mac was a really interesting guy. This is a guy who built his own house. He flew airplanes, was an avid bicyclist, and the sundialing, well, we saw some of that already and how he was awarded. This was a guy who really grabbed all of life. And I love his programs as well. Thanks for watching the 6502 Show. It's been my pleasure to be here with you. And until we see each other again, take care.